Ted's Afternoon Off By Lucy Maud Montgomery Ted was up at five that morning, as usual. He always had to rise early to kindle the fire and go for the cows, but on this particular morning there was no head to about it. He had awakened at four o'clock and had sprung eagerly to the little garret window facing the east, to see what sort of a day was being born. Thrilling with excitement, he saw that it was going to be a glorious day. The sky was all rosy and golden and clear beyond the sharp pointed, dark firs on Lee's Hill. Out to the north the sea was shimmering and sparkling gaily, with little foam crests here and there ruffled up by the cool morning breeze. Oh, it would be a splendid day. And he, Ted Melvin, was to have a half-holiday for the first time since he had come to live in Brookdale four years ago, a whole afternoon off to go to the Sunday school picnic at the beach beyond the big hotel. It almost seemed too good to be true. The Jacksons, with whom he had lived ever since his mother had died, did not think holidays were necessities for boys. Hard work and cast-off clothes, and three grudgingly allowed months of school in the winter, made up Ted's life year in and year out, his outer life at least. He had an inner life of dreams, but nobody knew or suspected anything about that. To everybody in Brookdale he was simply Ted Melvin, a shy, odd-looking little fellow with big dreamy black eyes and a head of thick tangled curls which could never be made to look tidy and always annoyed Mrs. Jackson exceedingly. It was as yet too early to light the fire or go for the cows. Ted crept softly to a corner in the garret and took from the wall an old brown fiddle. It had been his father's. He loved to play on it, and his few rare spare moments were always spent in the garret corner or the hayloft, with his precious fiddle. It was his one link with the old life he had lived in a little cottage far away, with a mother who had loved him and a merry young father who had made wonderful music on the old brown violin. Ted pushed open his garret window and, seating himself on the sill, began to play, with his eyes fixed on the glowing eastern sky. He played very softly, since Mrs. Jackson had a pronounced dislike to being wakened by fiddling at all unearthly hours. The music he made was beautiful and would have astonished anybody who knew enough to know how wonderful it really was. But there was nobody to hear this little neglected urchin of all work, and he fiddled away happily, the music floating out of the garret window, over the treetops and the dew-wet clover fields, until it mingled with the wines and was lost in the silver skies of the morning. Ted worked doubly hard all that forenoon, since there was a double share of work to do if, as Mrs. Jackson said, he was to be goodying to picnics in the afternoon. But he did it all cheerily and whistled for joy as he worked. After dinner Mrs. Ross came in. Mrs. Ross lived down on the shore road and made a living for herself and her two children by washing and doing day's work out. She was not a very cheerful person and generally spoke as if on the point of bursting into tears. She looked more doleful than ever today, and lost no time in explaining why. I've just got word that my sister over at White Sands is sick with pendiikis, this was the nearest Mrs. Ross could get to appendicitis, and has to go to the hospital. I've got to go right over and see her, Mrs. Jackson and I've run in to ask if Ted can go and stay with Jimmy till I get back. There's no one else I can get, and Amelia is away. I'll be back this evening. I don't like leaving Jimmy alone. Ted's been promised that he could go to the picnic this afternoon, said Mrs. Jackson shortly. Mr. Jackson said he could go, so he'll have to please himself. If he's willing to stay with Jimmy instead, he can. I don't care. Oh, I've got to go to the picnic, cried Ted impulsively. I'm awful sorry for Jimmy, but I must go to the picnic. I suppose you feel so, said Mrs. Ross, sighing heavily. I dunno's I blame you. Picnics is more cheerful than staying with a poor little lame boy, I don't doubt. Well, I suppose I can put Jimmy's supper on the table close to him, and shut the cat in with him, and maybe he'll worry through. He was counting on having you to fiddle for him, though. Jimmy's crazy about music, and he don't never hear much of it. Speaking of fiddling, there's a great fiddler stopping at the hotel now. His name is Blair Milford, and he makes his living fiddling at concerts. I knew him well when he was a child, I was nurse in his father's family. He was a taking little chap, and I was real fond of him. Well, I must be getting. Jimmy'll feel bad at staying alone, but I'll tell him he'll just have to put up with it. Mrs. Ross sighed herself away, and Ted flew up to his garret corner with a choking in his throat. He couldn't go to stay with Jimmy, he couldn't give up the picnic. Why, he had never been at a picnic, and they were going to drive to the hotel beach in wagons, and have swings, and games, and ice cream and a boat sail to Curtin Island. He had been looking forward to it, waking and dreaming, for a fortnight. He must go. But poor little Jimmy. It was too bad for him to be left all alone. I wouldn't like it myself, said Ted miserably, trying to swallow a lump that persisted in coming up in his throat. It must be dreadful to have to lie on the sofa all the time and never be able to run, climb trees or play, or do a single thing. And Jimmy doesn't like reading much. He'll be dreadful lonesome. I'll be thinking of him all the time at the picnic. I know I will. I suppose I could go and stay with him, if I just made up my mind to it. Making up his mind to it was a slow and difficult process. But when Ted was finally dressed in his shabby, skimpy Sunday best, 
he tucked his precious fiddle under his arm and slipped downstairs. Please, I think I'll go and stay with Jimmy, he said to Mrs. Jackson timidly, as he always spoke to her. Well, if you're to waste the afternoon, I suppose it's better to waste it that way than in going to a picnic and eating yourself sick, was Mrs. Jackson's ungracious response. Ted reached Mrs. Ross's little house just as that good lady was locking the door on Jimmy and the cat. Well, I'm real glad, she said, when Ted told her he had come to stay. I'd have worried most awful if I'd had to leave Jimmy all alone. He's crying in there this minute. Come now, Jimmy, dry up. Here's Ted come to stop with you after all, and he's brought his fiddle, too. Jimmy's tears were soon dried, and he welcomed Ted joyfully. I've been thinking awful long to hear you fiddling, said Jimmy, with a sigh of content. Seems like the ache ain't never half so bad when I'm listening to music, and when it's your music, I forget there's any ache at all. Ted took his violin and began to play. After all, it was almost as good as a picnic to have a whole afternoon for his music. The stuffy little room, with its dingy plaster and shabby furniture, was filled with wonderful harmonies. Once he began, Ted could play for hours at a stretch and never be conscious of fatigue. Jimmy lay and listened in rapturous content while Ted's violin sang and laughed and dreamed and rippled. There was another listener besides Jimmy. Outside, on the red sandstone doorstep, a man was sitting, a tall, well-dressed man with a pale, beautiful face and long, supple white hands. Motionless, he sat there and listened to the music until at last it stopped. Then he rose and knocked at the door. Ted, violin in hand, opened it. An expression of amazement flashed into the stranger's face, but he only said, Is Mrs. Ross at home? No, sir, said Ted shyly. She went over to White Sands and she won't be back till night. But Jimmy is here. Jimmy is her little boy. Will you come in? I'm sorry Mrs. Ross is away, said the stranger, entering. She was an old nurse of mine. I must confess I've been sitting on the step out there for some time, listening to your music. Who taught you to play, my boy? Nobody, said Ted simply. I've always been able to play. He makes it up himself out of his own head, sir, said Jimmy eagerly. No, I don't make it, it makes itself, it just comes, said Ted a dreamy gaze coming into his big black eyes. The caller looked at him closely. I know a little about music myself, he said. My name is Blair Milford and I am a professional violinist. Your playing is wonderful. What is your name? Ted Melvin. Well, Ted, I think that you have a great talent, and it ought to be cultivated. You should have competent instruction. Come, you must tell me all about yourself. Ted told what little he thought there was to tell. Blair Milford listened and nodded, guessing much that Ted didn't tell and, indeed, didn't know himself. Then he made Ted play for him again. Amazing. He said softly, under his breath. Finally he took the violin and played himself. Ted and Jimmy listened breathlessly. Oh, if I could only play like that. Said Ted wistfully. Blair Milford smiled. You will play much better someday if you get the proper training, he said. You have a wonderful talent, my boy, and you should have it cultivated. It will never in the world do to waste such genius. Yes, that is the right word, he went on musingly, as if talking to himself, genius. Nature is always taking us by surprise. This child has what I have never had and would make any sacrifice for. And yet in him it may come to naught for lack of opportunity. But it must not, Ted. You must have a musical training. I can't take lessons, if that is what you mean, sir, said Ted wonderingly. Mr. Jackson wouldn't pay for them. I think we needn't worry about the question of payment if you can find time to practice, said Blair Milford. I am to be at the beach for two months yet. For once I'll take a music pupil. But will you have time to practice? Yes, sir, I'll make time, said Ted, as soon as he could speak at all for the wonder of it. I'll get up at four in the morning and have an hour's practicing before the time for the cows. But I'm afraid it'll be too much trouble for you, sir, I'm afraid. Blair Milford laughed and put his slim white hand on Ted's curly head. It isn't much trouble to train an artist. It is a privilege. Ah, Ted, you have what I once hoped I had what I know now I never can have. You don't understand me. You will someday. Ain't he an awful nice man? Said Jimmy, when Blair Milford had gone. But what did he mean by all that talk? I don't know exactly, said Ted dreamily. That is, I seem to feel what he meant but I can't quite put it into words. But, oh, Jimmy, I'm so happy. I'm to have lessons, I have always longed to have them. I guess you're glad you didn't go to the picnic. Said Jimmy. Yes but I was glad before, Jimmy, honest I was. Blair Milford kept his promise. He interviewed Mr. and Mrs. Jackson and, by means best known to himself, induced them to consent that Ted should take music lessons every Saturday afternoon. He was a pupil to delight a teacher's heart and, after every lesson, 
Blair Milford looked at him with kindly eyes and murmured, amazing, under his breath. Finally he went again to the Jacksons, and the next day he said to Ted, Ted, would you like to come away with me, live with me, be my boy and have your gift for music thoroughly cultivated? What do you mean, sir? said Ted tremblingly. I mean that I want you, that I must have you, Ted. I've talked to Mr. Jackson, and he has consented to let you come. You shall be educated, you shall have the best masters in your art that the world affords, you shall have the career I once dreamed of. Will you come, Ted? Ted drew a long breath. Yes, sir, he said. But it isn't so much because of the music, it's because I love you, Mr. Milford, and I'm so glad I'm to be always with you.